speakers who want to ask questions from speakers to have their say, and then we'll go to the audience again. Do any speakers feel that any other speakers have not said everything that could possibly be said on the topic? No questions to address one another? I unfortunately missed both talks. Right. Okay. Um, Sorry. Audience, open mic. Oh, no. uh, Just a second. I promised it there. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, so uh, this question concerns something uh, Professor Searle was uh, talking about, but I suppose anyone can answer. So I, I briefly discussed it with you, but I was hoping we could discuss it in a bit more detail. So it concerns your proof concerning the falsity of uh, epiphenomenalism. Yeah. So you claim that we know that the physical world isn't causally closed because it seems that the physical act of you raising your arm is caused by the mental act of your intention to raise your arm, uh, to which it seems that a proponent of mental supervenience could say, well, if the mental supervenes on the physical, then there has to be uh, something physical underlying that mental intention, and it's that uh, physical, uh, say, the neural correlate that is actually causing your arm to raise. Yeah. And so the reply you gave me that, uh, you know, I was just, it's just two levels of description, that are describing the same phenomenon, and you likened it to saying that, you know, it's the, the car plug, or the plug that's causing the car to start, or the electrons of which uh, the car plug is composed that is causing the car to start. But I don't think this analogy works because it seems as though the car plug just is uh, the physical particles that compose it, whereas the mental experience of the mental of the intention to raise your arm is not just the uh, neural correlate underlying it. It seems like there's something that's contained in the mental that's not contained in the physical, namely the feeling of what it's like to intend to raise your arm. So I was hoping you could expand on that a little. Yeah. Uh, well, if I had to answer this in one sentence, I would say you're accepting the distinction between the mental and the physical that I'm rejecting. Uh, uh, that is, I think there's no question but what we have higher level biological phenomena, call them physical, and that these are conscious uh, and that they're all uh, causally reducible to their supervenience base. So is everything. Uh, so there's nothing special about them in that respect. They do have this unique feature, namely uh, subjectivity. And I think that's terrific. I just love subjectivity. But uh, I don't regard it as a metaphysical threat. And I agree, you know, all analogies break down. Actually, I learned something today from my colleagues up here. Uh, I love that guy who was hypnotized in a thing. He's something, uh, touching something hot, and he comes away with a blister. Son of a gun. I wish I had known that example before. I'm going to start using it. I'm not sure I believe it, but it's a hell of an example. Uh, but anyway, uh, of course, the guy's got a, a blister, and it's caused by a belief. Yeah, the belief supervenes on all kinds of crap going on in his brain. Uh, but all the same, it's real. Uh, that's that's the point I'm. I guess I'm trying to get across. The real curse here is the vocabulary. Is it? Well, if it's mental, it can't be physical, and if it's physical, it can't be mental. And that's why I gave you all that stuff about acetylcholine. It's about the one, the one neurotransmitter that I can actually remember how to pronounce it. Uh, but in any case, I, I, there are these different levels of description of what's going on in any system. The brain is not special in that regard. Uh, I, I'm Felix from uh, University of Montreal. I want to come back on the question of uh, the practical uh, implication. It's for Can you speak? Yeah. I, who's it uh, It's for uh, Dr. Amiraz, actually. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I so I want listen. to come back uh, about uh, the clinical and practical implications of uh, research on uh, hypnosis and placebo. So uh, beyond the fact that they're uh, really uh, interesting and, and amusing, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, clinicians can really learn from that uh, beyond what they, they already know intuitively. Uh, uh, beyond, beyond the fact, I think Many clinicians might know intuitively how to, uh, how to manipulate uh, beliefs and what circumstances to do it uh, and, uh, and uh, what kind of beliefs to manipulate also. So uh, what can they learn from, uh, from, uh, from that? And if, if my premise is wrong that they actually know uh, everything about that, then would it, would it be important before to do research about it to know exactly what do they know to learn? Or don't you, uh, maybe you don't have uh, clinical uh, or practical interest, but I don't. 
I'm just yeah. wondering. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think that um, hypnosis, first and foremost, is a, clinical, is a clinical intervention. I mean, even before we use it for, you know, uh, the kind of um, um, consciousness research, placebo research that I'm sort of talking about here, or psychological research, I think it's a very effective clinical procedure that, that um, uh, physicians and clinicians in general uh, can and should use. The trick with the, so first of all, uh, hypnosis is not taught in medical school, for example, and hypnosis is not typically taught in, uh, in, as part of a clinical psychology uh, program. It's just not. Um, and uh, if you ask physicians what they know about uh, hypnosis, they know very little, if anything. If they're lucky, they'll get like one lecture from like as an entertainer coming in or some kind of a side, you know, uh, a fringe uh, lecture. I think that's a mistake, but that has to do with the um, biomedical model that, uh, that we subscribe to in general. Um, uh, medicine today uh, and clinicians today, more than before, subscribe to a bottom-up model. So people really take reductionism very, very seriously. And they talk about, they spend a lot of time, and, and probably correctly so, you know, rightfully so. They talk a lot of time about molecular biology and about recombinant DNA and so on and so forth. And when we talk about, you know, a mosquito bite, we know a great deal about what's happening at this site, and we know about the antihistamines and the bredecaine, the, 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 you know, whatever, whatever is happening there we know quite well, and we can work our way up through the spinal cord and so on. There's relatively little um, that is going on in a medical school context, not because the people are not intelligent, they're super intelligent. It has to do also with tradition, it has to do also with science and, and what science advocates and, and, and vogue and, and, and fashion and so on. There's less or fewer examples of top-down medicine in a way that is compelling and is in line with what physicians are currently trained, how they're trained to think about. And as a result, uh, when you explain to people that, you know, if they take one placebo or three placebos, you get very different responses, most physicians don't know that. They, they were never taught that, you know, placebo is zero, so one placebo or three placebos is exactly the same. But it's not the same. And that's because people have symbolic thinking. And when people take three times a pill or they take one time a pill, it's a very different effect on them. But why is that, like in terms of a mechanism? Or why is it that, you know, blue placebos act differently from red placebos? These are very, these are serious questions. These are, you know, very, they have to do with symbolic thinking. They have to do with, you know, uh, top-down influence, with suggestion, with expectation, with, all the, with culture. It has to do with all these things. These are not typical things that are taught in the life sciences or in the medical sciences. This is more in, a, you know, in, in the social sciences, in, in philosophy department, psychology department, anthropology department, psychology department, and so on. And, and it's important to understand that you know, we are now getting through things like you know, consciousness and, and, and discussing these things are very transdisciplinary, almost by definition, that some of these discussions are beginning to generate some crosstalk. And then you're getting, you're, you know, people by definition are being exposed and, and they listen to some other ideas about how these things come about. Um, and, of course, they bring their own biases and their own skepticism and their own, you know, uh, insecurities about uh, various things. But there's no question that uh, for hypnosis to even survive until today, uh, part of the reason that it survives is because it's effective. I mean, people can actually reduce their pain with hypnosis. And this is a fact. I mean, you can't argue with that because you, you can see that they can sustain and endure pain in a much higher, you know, much higher the, the, the degrees or to a higher level than they could without it. And this is not just, so, you know, uh, uh, John just mentioned the, uh, the, the blister uh, thing before, but we have a very long list of, of, of things that, that, that could go on clinically even before we take it into the lab. Taking it to the lab is a recent innovation. It's a recent innovation. It's basically saying, well, if we can do all these clinical things, and if this can be so powerful clinically, can we maybe harness it, leverage it into some kind of a scientific paradigm where we can actually study what's happening in order to answer a very specific... That's a fairly recent innovation in, in, in modern scientific thought. So to answer your question specifically, yes, I, I do think that, that hypnosis and techniques like hypnosis have a place as part of the modern physician's armamentarium. Um, but I, I think it also has a place as a, an interesting 
um, uh, tool to illuminate and to actually explore some interesting questions such as related to consciousness just because of this conference uh, wh where, where some of the uh, questions are very tricky and what you need to do is you need to create some very subtle either double dissociations or you need to take healthy people and turn them into patients and you know, do all kinds of things uh, of that nature. How effective placebo is the proof is in the pudding. It's been around long enough. It's been around thousands of years. People actually went through surgery under hypnosis and so on. The question is, how does it work? And that's, that's more difficult to, to answer. What exactly is going on? How come you know, some people are able to do it? We're still trying to figure that out, but that's true for many things in medicine, not just hypnosis. Okay, thank you. Hi, my question is also for, for Dr. Raz. Um, so you, you said you have an index of suggestibility. So I'm curious, first of all, what are some of the questions that you would ask to decide of whether somebody would be more or less susceptible? And also whether, um, I assume you've tested a large part of the population, whether it's like bell-shaped or bimodal or, you know, what kind of distribution do you see? Okay. So, <clears throat> so there, there are a number of ways to um, identify highly hypnotizable people. The, the way that I described in my lecture, which is sort of the tried and true way, uh, actually coming from um, John Kilstrom, who's a colleague of John at, at uh, UC Berkeley, is a way whereby you take the Stanford, which is one tool, and you take the Harvard, which is the other tool, and you put people through both. And you take only the people who have the highest scores on both uh, tests, and these people who scored very high on the Harvard and the Stanford both, these are the people that you use as highly hypnotizable people. Now, what is on the Harvard? What is on the Stanford? First of all, it's, it's, complete, it's, it's available on the web, so you can go and you can look it up and you'll get it. Um, it is, so the Harvard is actually a group scale. Uh, we can administer it, it to, to, to this group, and uh, we basically play a tape, and the tape has all the instructions on it uh, with the specific times, and, and, and it asks people to relax and it takes you through a relaxation procedure at the beginning just so that you know everybody starts at the same place and then it's it asks people to um, imagine all kinds of things that are either happening or you're not sure that they're happening so for example um, it might ask you to um, um, extend your arm and after a while it will tell you well you know as, as time goes by you can feel that your arm is getting heavier you know that it's not getting heavier it's just that your muscles are getting a little bit more fatigued but you know it feels that your arm is getting heavier and as it gets heavier you have a, you feel like it's going down you just feel it's more difficult for you to keep it in place it's going down it's going down and you can see how you know some people respond to this very strongly um, it also asks you to uh, imagine that there's a mosquito in the room and you know can you hear the mosquito and then people as they begin to focus on listening to whether there is a mosquito in the room they begin to interpret, for example, the crackle of the audio system, and they say, is this the mosquito that they're talking about? Or I, ju I just had a little you know, uh, itch over here. Is this the mosquito that they're talking about? Suddenly they find themselves very itchy and very uncomfortable, and so suddenly there's a mosquito, like the notion of a mosquito. So for some people it's very real. For other people it just goes above their heads and they don't relate to it at all. So it's a whole series of um, uh, pretend kind of exercises like that that... Uh, takes you through a particular procedure that has been tried on thousands and thousands of people, and it turns out that people who score highly on these things, both on the Stanford and the, and the, and the Harvard, they're quite different in terms of their um, orientation and, and how they were designed and so on, but it turns out that when you put them together, you actually are able to get very good, um, uh, a very good feeling for who's highly hypnotizable. The, the other thing that is good to know is that uh, people who are extremely highly hypnotizable, in other words, they're really at the very far end of the curve, are very you know, few and far between. So I would say you know, people who are extremely, extremely suggestible are less than 10% of the population. Um, on the other hand, people who are extremely unsuggestible are also about 10% of the population. It's extremely unlikely. So these are the two poles, about 10% in each. And then in the middle, like the, the, the remaining 80% is like there's a range. You know, some people are, you know, so that's more of the Gaussian, you know, over there. But there's like 10% over here and 10% over there, like really strong bimodal kind of distribution. Now, the interesting thing is that Although I told you during the lecture, and I don't take that back, that, that hypnosis is largely stable, this is true in your adult life. During your development, or during our development, uh, hypnotizability actually peaks around the age of 11 or 12. And that's very interesting, because 
uh, uh, individuals who are, children are extremely susceptible to hypnotic uh, uh, suggestions, even if, they're not, even if there's no informal or formal induction. So, for example, if you've ever, if you have like little nephews or, or, or nieces or, you know, if you, if you interact with some small, younger children in the family, if you read a story to them, just read them a story, and you make it a little bit dramatic, and you tell them, you know, it was a really cold day, and you know, and we had, you can actually see on, on children, like pilar erection, you can see their little hairs, you know, they're getting goosebumps just, just, from, just from listening to, to uh, you know, a story about snow, and it's a cold day, and all these things. This is really no different, really no different from the blister that we were talking about uh, before on a smaller scale. You can actually take words, and in the right, with the right narrative, and in the right context and with the right presentation, create a very strong presentation for the person with the right context, with the right cultural you know, wording and, and cadences and, and so on. You can create a very strong impact on a person and you, cr you can actually change one's physiology in a big way and, and in a way that would be conducive to a particular thing that you're trying to achieve. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, just to mix it up a little bit over here, I, I addressed a question to Dr. Plourd in connection with that. Since people, uh, since I know that you use body weight in measuring how much anesthesia to do, would it not make sense to use hypnotic susceptibility as well and then mix your, your, your poisons? Well, that's certainly a, a thought that uh, is worth uh, following up. Uh, I must confess that uh, myself and all the anesthesiologists that I know uh, do not use hypnosis and we have no, no we know very little if anything but uh, I'm sure that uh, my participation here will uh, lead me to follow up on the potential for hypnosis and there are procedures where it would benefit for example uh, at uh, the Montreal Institute we do um, Montreal Hosp Mont Neurological Hospital where I work uh, we do occasional awake craniotomies, and I think the, for, for these uh, procedures, we currently use uh, sedative drugs and opioids, but the adjunct of uh, hypnosis could certainly be of benefit. What so, percentage of patients do you think would be susceptible, that would be uh, eligible? It's difficult to say. It, 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 the, the interesting thing about these things that in a clinical situation, unlike when you come to a lab and you're just you know a regular participant and there's nothing distressing you or you're, you're, not, you're not particularly motivated, you know, you're not invested in this process in a particular way. When you are invested in a particular process, the same is true for placebo effects, by the way. If you're desperate, the placebo effect is much higher, much, much higher. So if you have a personal investment in what's going on and you're even mildly hypnotizable, that's going to make your reaction to hypnosis a lot stronger. If you're low, you're probably going to be pushed towards, towards, towards the mild. So I would say it's much higher than 10 percent of the Okay, of I'm not going to keep intervening, but for those who are going to the workshops uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, those who are going to the Gosselin workshop, you're going to see an example of the kind of thing that uh, Amir was speaking about. Um, uh, Gosselin shows pictures of zeros on a, a black zero on a white background to subjects and uh, trains them as he, uh, he, he makes the, the, uh, the black zero paler and paler and he trains them on saying which times they only see white and which times they see a black zero on white making the task harder and harder until he brings it to the point where actually there is no zero it's just random uh, gray and he tells them that at this point it's 50 percent zero and 50 percent not zero just blindsight it for me and tell me which one's zero and which one's one. And afterwards, he takes the, the, uh, the trials. These are all random stimuli. He takes the trials that the subjects called zero and the trials that they called not zero, and he does averaging on them. And guess what you find in the zero trials? A zero comes out because of this focused attention. They're going on a little bit of zero likeness here, a little mosquito here, and a mosquito bite here. And in the end, average over trials, you have a zero. OK, next question. Uh, hi, Pauline, University of Montreal. I would like to come back. Uh, this is a question for the whole panel. Um, I would like to come back on the comment on memory made uh, earlier um, uh, this morning. Uh, we, I know that some people argued uh, during this summer, this summer school that memory was not necessary uh, for consciousness, but uh, we kept saying that consciousness was all about feeling 
and what uh, was all about feelings and that the uh, only feelings matters when you talked about uh, consciousness. But I was wondering, uh, what does really matter? Is that the fact that you feel or is that the fact that you know that you feel? Because if you don't remember that you feel something, uh, is, is that really consciousness? So in, in to which extent memory is necessary to consciousness and to, <coughs> and to make the, the, the distinction between feelings and consciousness? I didn't have a chance to go into this, uh, so let me say a little bit about it now. For the sheer existence of a subjective feeling, uh, you do not require memory of previous feelings. But for human consciousness, organized human consciousness, you have to have a good working or iconic, I mean, the memory ter terminology keeps changing, but you have to have some kind of a, a working or iconic memory. Think of speaking. If I, it sometimes happens to me that I begin a sentence without even having a very clear idea of how it might end, but nonetheless in the course of the sentence I manage to add further clauses as things occur to me until finally I begin to wonder how the hell am I going to end this goddamn sentence. But if I can't remember how I ever even began it, then I would be in a very deep trouble. So you have to, just to do minimal things like carry on a conversation, you have to have working memory. Memory organizes your consciousness. And it's interesting, you see, that um, <clears throat> our folk conception of memory is kind of a storehouse. We, we now know that's wrong. I mean, there are, all, there are lots of different kinds of memory, lots of very good research is going on right now about uh, this. I, and the, the point for consciousness is organized consciousness requires organized memory. Okay, because when we when we talk about ethical, um, uh, if, if you want to talk about ethics in animals, and if if we consider that if an animal has consciousness, it has rights. You but see, if yeah. if uh, if what matters is the the fact that you know that you feel and that you remember that you are aware that you feel, and not the fact that you feel, is that a good reason? Uh, how can we say that the animal knows that if he, he, he actually feels? See, too many things are included in the concept of memory. You don't have to be Marcel Proust in order to be conscious, you know. I don't have to. I bit into the goddamn Madeleine and it all came back to me, a whole universe. You don't have to have that to be conscious. But, you, but the, um, point, uh, the point I was trying to get across is that the suggestion that, that um, uh, consciousness is completely independent of memory, if we're talking about healthy uh, uh, functioning consciousness, it's not. You have to be able to organize your experience. Yeah. Yeah, so if, but, uh, if an animal can't remember I think this works for animals, too. Okay. My doggy has to be able to recognize me coming down the path, and then he has to continue that recognition all the way into the house. If he's forgotten by the time, if he decides to bite me once I get in the house because he no longer recognizes me, I, we're all in trouble. So animals have the same. Yeah. Well, in, uh, from the clinical point of view, there are dissociations where we have uh, drugs like scopolamine and benzodiazepines that produce dense amnesia. So, of course, at the time, the, the, the subjects show no recollections for events that occur during now. At the time of occurrence, they do have some form of working memory, and if you ask them something a few seconds or even a minute later, they will have some form of memory, but if you ask them next day what happened, they often it's a total blank, and I experienced it myself during a diagnostic procedure, and... Uh, I, the last thing I remember is I was lifting my head for the nurse to put the oxygen uh, tubing, to facilitate putting the oxygen tubing, and the next thing I know is that uh, uh, I was in the recovery room, and they assured me that I was not unconscious and that I kept talking all the way through. <laughs> So, so, so consciousness is. So not, I was presumably conscious, but no recollection. So we can't we can't say that feelings that consciousness is all about feelings because you can be conscious and not be aware that you feel. You, you
missed one part of this. They use scopolamine in order to, uh, to uh, anesthetize women during childbirth. They scream bloody murder. They just don't complain afterwards because they've forgotten. By your lights, no complaints, no pain. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi, uh, Vincent from UCAM. Sorry to bring back the ghost of epiphenomenalism again. Um, but with all the talks we've had this week, we've had many indications um, showing that consciousness might be useful, at least for, well, not much. We, there wasn't a, a, any, anybody that talked that showed that th that consciousness was useful for this. And I'm talking about phenomen uh, I'm talking about the phenomenal phenomenologic consciousness, not the consciousness of higher processes or higher order thoughts, from no, no matter how you call them. But basically, every function had indication that they didn't info didn't need f uh, consciousness. So. Uh, you say there's, uh, well, this argument's for Mr. Searle, uh, obvi obviously. Uh, you say there's so many functions to consciousness that you can't start naming them. But actually, if you could name one, I know, I know at least a few scientists who talked here this week would be grateful. Was that for me? Yep. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> All right. Name one, yeah. name one function of consciousness. You said there are lots. Just okay. name one. Sex. You want more? Well, Eating. actually, actually, you don't um, need. Uh, I mean, I'll go through the uh, the the favorite list. I can't eat when I'm unconscious. I can't have sex when I'm unconscious. I I can't carry on a conversation when I'm unconscious, and, and so on. With very large number of cases. I mean, I can keep going with this list. I can't run away from danger when I'm conscious. I can't earn a living uh, when I'm unconscious. So consciousness has all of these functions. Simply imagine that right now I went into a coma. I would no longer be able to function for anything. I'd just lie on the floor and they'd do the usual bit where they call for an ambulance and uh, various other things and people would, would uh, take my temperature. Uh, I once was giving a lecture and a guy had an epileptic fit in the middle of it. Fortunately, in the audience was one of the world's leading experts on epilepsy. He just took charge. But the guy in the fit, we, uh, he couldn't do anything. He was uh, uh, functionless. So consciousness, you see, it's easy to imagine a science fiction world where we're all robots, uh, but that's not the world we live in. In the world we live in, we cannot function without consciousness. Do you want me to continue the list? I can't write articles. I can't give my lectures. I can't drive my car. All of those require consciousness. They require you to be uh, awake and in and your body to be functional, but you don't need a phenomenal experience to do that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. You, you don't? Phenomenal experience. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you do. I don't know what is added by phenomenal uh, there, but I need conscious experience in order to do anything. Just imagine, so to speak, that I had never become conscious in, in the course of the day, that I, I, I that I, so to speak, woke up unconscious and just lay there in the bed all day. I would not have given this lecture. I would not have made my way here. I wouldn't have had lunch. I wouldn't. We, you and I can't carry on this conversation unless we're both conscious. Why well, not? What? Why not? Why, why not? not? Well, the short answer is that's how nature works. Uh, the okay. detailed answer is that the capacity to take in information of the kind that comes from you asking this question and me formulating an answer requires that I be conscious both of the question and of the resources necessary to give the answer. No consciousness, no understanding, no answer. Uh, how much? How much actually? Uh, do how much information do I have to be getting before I need consciousness? Well, we don't really know the answer. Then I think information is one of the most confused notions in contemporary intellectual life. In general, there are certain words where people use the word, and it's a sign they really don't know what they're talking about. And information is is uh, one of those. I, I but I. <laughs> There won't be any answer to the question, how much information uh, do you have to have? Now, now, of course, there are enormous numbers of things going on in me right now that are cognitively crucial that are entirely unconscious. There are ways I have of processing the input data uh, that tell me uh, those people at the back of the room didn't shrink. Uh, they're just further away. It's almost size constancy and so on with the 
the, the, the uh, chairs over here didn't change color. That's color constancy. So there are all kinds of unconscious processing that enable consciousness to function. But you better be conscious or you're not going to do any of this stuff. I mean, I have a job trying to hire people for the philosophy department, but I, I, unconscious candidates need not apply. I mean, you... <laughs> Well, I, I know a, something that's totally unconscious that built, uh, I know something that is entirely unconscious and that built the most powerful machine ever, and that's called RM polymerase that reads a, a DNA basically and just builds a machine from it, and it's no way conscious and it treats enormous amounts of information. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question again. <laughs> Why don't you speak up? Speak up. You have a microphone. One, two, one, two. Okay. So, DNA polymerase is unconscious. Uh, DNA is unconscious, yeah, sure. And what, whatever takes DNA and makes proteins out of it is unconscious. It is processing enormous amounts of information, and yeah. it is unconscious. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, exactly the confusion I was trying to point out earlier. In the intrinsic, non-observer relative sense, DNA hasn't got any information. What it's got is a certain molecular structure and that molecular structure enables it to behave as if it had information, but it's all as if. Roughly speaking, outside human and animal brains, there is no information. There's just a world that we can interpret, and a lot of it's useful to interpret as information, but that's all as if, it's all observer relative. The only intrinsic, non-observer relative information in the world is in human and animal brains, but I'm surrounded by devices, I didn't bring them all, uh, but they have all sorts of information encoded in them, uh, libraries and computers and uh, databases and so on. But all that information is observer relative. It all exists relative to our capacity to interpret. There is no information in the universe outside of human and animal brains. It's just a natural world that we can interpret. <clears throat> and and uh, if you understand this point, you will avoid many massive confusions. Uh, one massive confusion is to say, well, whenever there's information, there's consciousness. So the whole universe is conscious. The universe is suffused with consciousness. We live in a sea. I, I, I don't want to get going on this, but anyway. It's, it's a, there are so many forms of intellectual sickness out there uh, that I, I don't have a, enough years left to cure all of them. But this confusion about information is one I'd like to work on. All right, thank you. Hi, um, speaking of crosstalk, uh, I'm currently working as a, as a visual artist, and I was just wondering, um, I heard, um, I guess, Dr. Searle's uh, uh, conference, but I didn't hear this morning, in terms of what has been associated to consciousness, I've heard unity and also intentionality, right? Yeah, and two other features were subjectivity and qualitativeness, yeah. Okay, well, as a visual artist, I can tell you that when I'm creating, yeah. I often am creating without unconsciously, unintentionally yeah, creating no, I, something. Yeah, I love this kind of question. Right. So, so I was wondering if, if, any, if there was any, I mean, since you guys are in cognitive sciences, has anyone studied the creative process? And, yeah. and the second part of my question was, uh, in terms of unity, in terms of um, DID or dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder, since we see fragmented uh, or at least temporally united but temporally you know, fragmented uh, consciousness states. Has yeah. anyone done research or used those kinds of, um, of phenomenon to further uh, yeah. our understanding of where does consciousness come and what does it serve? Okay, I, I love this question and I will give the following inadequate answer. Uh, first of all, nobody has a theory of creativity. I'd love to have a theory of creativity, but the ones you see, how did Mozart do it? Well, he just combined the notes differently from other people. Well, thanks a lot. That really doesn't tell, tell me a hell of a lot uh, about uh, Mozart's creativity. There's just the fact that some people are more creative than others. Of course, Shakespeare could combine words better than other people, but somehow or other you feel something got left out, if you, that's what you um, I, I think is the key to understanding creativity. The other point, though, that I do want to emphasize, and, and that is, again, I didn't have a chance to give my whole theory of consciousness in the lecture. All consciousness has an aesthetic dimension. 
You want to know the foundation of aesthetics? It's built into the structure of consciousness. For every conscious experience, uh, there is a question. How did you uh, enjoy it? Was it fun? Was it boring, tiresome, amusing, exciting, thrilling? And that means all of those categories apply to uh, all conscious experience. They're all conscious experiences are on the pleasure, unpleasure dimension. And basically, that's the foundation of aesthetics. That's, that's the basis on which art is, is built, uh, is the fact that we're built into the structure of human consciousness is this aesthetic dimension. I'm sorry the answer is inadequate because it's a very deep question. Uh, since you brought up the musician, I just wanted to add that I read somewhere, I forget which great classic composer has actually written in an autobiography that he himself was not creating. His conscious experience was that his sonatas and his uh, yeah. waltzes were not created by him, but he was merely like a channel for some kind of other consciousness. Yeah. But I'll leave it at that. Well, you never know what to make of, of, of people's description of how they do their own uh, work. Uh, and I, uh, you know, maybe that's the correct description. I don't know. Hi. <laughs> I just want to take a few seconds uh, to thank, sorry, to thank er everyone who participated in organi organizing the summer school. I had a great time. And I know from talking with my peers that uh, this, this feeling is generalized. So a uh, great job to the volunteers and uh, Stephen. And <laughs> Uh, also, could I have the photograph that I requested a little while ago? We're, we're, it's not over. The thanks are not over. Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not at the workshop. Anyways, it's just uh, it's my occasion. Okay, then uh, my question goes to uh, Dr. Seal. Uh, take no offense, but uh, I woke up this morning. I had no idea who you were. I went through your wiki page, and uh, I, f I, f uh, I landed on the, this thing called the Chinese Room, and I had the chance to read a bit about it. So let me... But let me put, put it this way. <clears throat> we have a machine that speaks Chinese without understanding it. Yeah. And we have the, this other machine, the brain, that, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> the brain that, uh, that is conscious without understanding what is consciousness. Yeah. Now, does the brain understand Chinese? Uh, let's say uh, the, the brain of a Chinese guy. Does, does it understand Chinese? And how is it different uh, from just speaking it? Yeah. Uh, uh, my brain can understand English and no Chinese. Um, I'm famous for not being able to understand Chinese. Uh, <laughs> in fact, in China, I learned only two uh, expressions, and they uh, told me uh, that I was mispronouncing them. Uh, uh, one was uh, bu yao. It's what uh, girls say, and it means, please stop doing that. Um, <laughs> And the other was Mayo, means we don't have any. And uh, when we got to Shanghai, my translator, I said, well, do they speak a different dialect? He said, I can't understand a word these people say. And I said, well, how do they say Bu Yao? He says, impossible. They say Bu Yao. I can't understand that. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I had to agree with that. <laughs> and so on with other cases. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, you have to ask yourself, what is the unit? Uh, but my brain is fairly good at English, weaker at French, and uh, Chinese virtually non-existent. Oh, uh, yeah, but what's the difference? Okay, then let's just uh, put it in English then. You have a machine that speaks English yeah. and the brain the, that understands English. What's the, the difference? The, the, the point is, it isn't a question of machine. My brain is a machine. Yeah. We are all machines. Yeah. If the question is, could a machine be conscious and understand English, I raise my hand. I'm a conscious machine that understands English. We're all, uh, if you like, we're all robots because we're all uh, conscious machines. Uh, the point is, we have something that existing uh, computational machines don't have. Namely, we know what the words mean. And that was the power of the Chinese room. In the Chinese room, I don't know what any of the words mean. I just have what a computer has, namely rules for manipulating symbols. So the question is not, could a machine have consciousness and understand language? Of course, we're all machines. The question is, could a digital computer, as defined by Alan Turing, that is to say, a machine that uh, um, uh, carries out Turing programs, manipulates uh, strictly zeros and ones, could that understand just in virtue of manipulating zeros and ones? And the answer is no, because it's got a syntax and no semantics. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, Anna from University of British Columbia. My question is for Amir Ras. And uh, you got my attention that hypnosis is a valid state and that has little knowledge in the psychology or clinician field. But I feel that after your presentation, I still lack a proper description of this state. So I feel like there was little knowledge passed about it. So I would, want to, I would ask you to give a, a coherent description of what is hypnosis. Okay. 
Okay, so <clears throat> it's tricky, and I'll try to uh, untrick it a little bit. So um, let's say that somebody came to me and um, they were hypnotized. Would I be able to tell that they're under hypnosis? So there's a very clear answer to that, and the answer is probably not. Because there is no direct index that I can use. There's no blood test, there's no scan, there, there's nothing that I can do other than to go on some kind of a behavioral, um, but I can't look at a behavioral indication when I don't know what the baseline is. Like how is this person, if I, if I could maybe see before and after, that would be different. Now, this is a little bit tricky because if you cannot have a direct quantification or a direct way to see if somebody is in a state, or as I told you, sometimes some people take issue with the word state, but it doesn't matter, it's even, it's even more fundamental than that. What is the definition of hypnosis? And that's not, you know, people are like sitting around in committees and coming out with like manifestos about these kind of things, and it doesn't really help any. Now, I said to you during my lecture that it's attentive, receptive concentration, and I left it at that. It's sort of a very sort of vague, hand wavy kind of thing, but it's sort of, it's something that involves attention. It's sometimes it's something that involves concentration. Now, you see, attention is something that we know a great deal about because for more than 100 years, it's one of the pillars of psychological research in, in modern time. So in psychology, re attention is probably the most researched topic in cognitive science ever. Um, and if we can basically take the word hypnosis, flush, you know, flush it down the toilet just for purposes of conversation, and conceptualize and operationalize what is happening to these people through the lens of attention, we feel much more comfortable with it because we know a great deal about attention, a great deal. So in terms of attentional mechanisms and the neural correlates of attention and what is happening, you know, mechanisms of attention and the underlying neurobiology of attention and the neurotransmitters and the neurochemistry and the functional anatomy, if we talk about that in terms of attention, we understand it actually pretty well. And then there's nothing magical about hypnosis. It's just a situation when people are paying extreme attention to something. And that's the right way to think about it. That's the correct way to think about it. It's a, it's a situation, it's an experience where somebody, a person, can bring himself or herself into attending in an extreme way to a particular piece of information or set of information in a way that by doing this they can do it to the exclusion of you know, attending to other things. And this is very powerful because when, when you do something like that, suddenly you have, either as a consequence or as an epiphenomenon, we're not quite sure, but as a result of that, you develop all kinds of things. For example, you have um, a uh, sus you know, suspension of disbelief. It just happens. I mean, when people are going through these kind of experiences, they have suspension of disbelief. So very weird things can be, they can think very weird things or you can suggest very weird things, to them, and they don't consider it to be weird at all. Very similar to what happens to you when you dream, although hypnosis has nothing to do with dreaming. Okay, so the same thing is, so for example, we have an anesthesiologist here. After hypnosis, some people develop spontaneous amnesia. We, we don't tell them don't, don't remember. We don't tell them, you know, you shouldn't remember any of these things. We don't give them any drugs. Yet some people have very dense amnesia after hypnosis. We're still not clear why this is happening, but it's happening. And it's very interesting to see the parallels, you know, when you actually use very potent analgesics to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, sedate people for medical purposes. So... This is a very um, um, precarious and you know, difficult to, to palpate kind of field on the one hand. On the other hand, the behavioral phenomena that we get is so dramatic and is so um, approachable that we cannot ignore it. Like we can't just say, oh, you know, we, we don't know enough about it, therefore we can't you know, discuss it. Very similar to consciousness, right? So, you know, this is the kind of, hypnosis is the kind of thing that I, I could not wait until I got tenure in order to study. Okay, although, uh, you know, other people told me, don't do that until you have tenure, just like John said before. But th this was so dramatic for me. It was so dramatic for me, I said, I, I, I have to understand this. But it's not the only thing that I do. So it's, it's very important to understand that when it comes to hypnosis, if you operationalize it through things that we really know a little bit about, attention is, is one of them, it puts a completely different spin on the whole thing. It becomes less mystical and a lot more grounded in, in modern research. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Maxwell from U Montreal. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Searle. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you'd agree with uh, Professor Harnad. Uh, we, we were talking about um, a question of vocabulary, uh, that uh, we have maybe too many words to be referring to uh, the same kind of phenomena. I was wondering, wondering if you would, would agree with this, uh, this kind of statement, uh, that, that maybe uh, we should just be speaking of feeling as opposed to consciousness, and uh, that considering the, this, uh, uh, the situation, uh, if, if traditional phenomenology is still of any use at all? Uh, well, I think, in fact, the, the, the a weakness of the vocabulary is one of the difficulties in the whole discussion. And the worst part of the vocabulary is the dualistic vocabulary that makes it seem like things are either mental or physical. And the reason for telling you that my uh, intention and action uh, has to have a biochemical structure to, to enable it to, to, to secrete acetylcholine was to challenge the vocabulary. I want to say you can't make this distinction between the mental and the physical. It's okay for sort of uh, practical purposes. You know, my mind is willing, but my flesh is weak, or where, however it goes. Um, uh, but there, all that's okay. But but when it comes for rigorous uh, uh, philosophical purposes, the vocabulary is no good. Now, I am reluctant to substitute feeling for consciousness because many of my conscious states, state have no correlated feeling. If I just think um, uh, two is a, a prime number, it's the only even prime number, there isn't any special feeling that goes with that. So I'm reluctant to use feeling. Now, people say, well, then, is it really qualitative to think, uh, is there any qualitative character? I think there is. That is, if you think there's no qualitative character to having thoughts, I uh, say about arithmetic, think 2 plus 2 equals 4, and then think the same thing in French and German. feels completely different to me in that respect. I, so they said different qualitative character. Do it, do stuff, a cat, zwei und zwei sind vier. You sound like a Nazi, when, or at least I do whenever I try to speak German. Um, uh, so there are different qualitative characters, but I'm reluctant to use the word feeling uh, uh, for uh, everything because not all of my thoughts would typically be characterized as a feel, having a feeling. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Michaela Manson from Concordia. Um, so my question goes to Professor Searle, um, and it's about uh, when you talked about there being a pre-existing conscious field, and you related that to Chomps Chomsky and structures um, that are sort of innate in human brains. And I, I would also, I think, compare it to the sort of Kantian or organizational structures of phenomenological time and space that we have. Um, and so, but, the, but when you sought to illustrate it, you referred to this example of you waking up in a dark room and then turning on the light and then being, discovering all these visual experiences. Um, and I guess the problem with that example is that you're not in a pre perceptory state before you turn on the light. You're not in what kind of state? Like you're not in a like non-sensory state. You still have sensory experience um, prior to your turning on the light in that example. So, like my question is kind of how does the how can it, like this pre-consciousness uh, field exist or be studied um, apart from its direct relationship to our sensory experiences? So, yeah. in this fact that you say that perception yeah. modifies it. Yeah. Okay, the, the point of the analogy, and I probably didn't make it sufficiently clear, is this. You should think of all of your consciousness as existing within a unified conscious field. Now, the point of imagining you waking up in a dark room is the field can exist when it hasn't got anything in it. You can be conscious of the field. Now, I think a good way to see this is with vision. If I put my hand over my eyes, I stop seeing anything, but I still continue to be visually conscious. In my case, uh, there are various uh, yellow, I, I would call them yellow, not literally yellow, because yellow can be seen and these can't be seen, but there are various I, I, ex experiences that I'm having, various phenomenological experiences. So the visual field exists independently of seeing anything. You've only got to close your eyes. See, for example, there's nothing back here in my visual field where there definitely is something here. It goes, I mean, roughly speaking, from the um, uh, top of my forehead to the chin. I have a visual field which is part of the total conscious field. And the total conscious field 
is something that exists independently of particular perceptions. So the model that I was challenging was the one that says consciousness is created by perception. And the model that I'm trying to substitute for that is, no, perception modifies an in, a previously existing conscious field. I, and I take the metaphor seriously, think of it like a green field, and then the bumps and hillocks occur in the field when you see anything. You're actually getting a change in the structure of the field when, whenever you perceive anything. That's the picture I'm trying to substitute for the standard picture. See, the standard picture I call a building block conception, and we're to think of our consciousness as created with a whole lot of separate units. You see red, you see a shape, uh, uh, and so on, and then the consciousness is the totality of those. And the picture that I'm giving is, no, the brain creates a conscious field and then perception modifies the conscious field and one of the reasons for the disappointing character of a lot of research on consciousness is they proceed on what I think is a false assumption uh, the assumption uh, what I call a building block assumption that the conscious field is made up of independent uh, units in, in, uh, independent entities uh, and you could analyze how the brain perceives one of those, you've cracked the whole problem of consciousness. I think that's not right. Now, that's an empirical question. It won't be settled by philosophical analysis. Why do I think I'm right and these guys are wrong? Well, the answer to that is that their theory would predict that if you could introduce the neural correlate of consciousness for the experience of red in an otherwise unconscious person, the guy would have a flash of red and go back into unconsciousness. And I don't think that's how the brain works. I, that's not how my alarm clock works. My alarm clock doesn't just give me a, a flash of sound and then I go back into unconsciousness. No, it creates a conscious field by stimulating me. It's interesting how uh, alarm clocks work, by the way. A standard mistake is to say, well, you, you couldn't have heard the alarm clock unless uh, you were conscious of it, so you must have a kind of unconscious conscious. Well, I don't want to go into that. all the mistakes people make. But anyway, that's the, the reason I gave that example. Pierre Vanet, you can. Uh, my question is for Professor Searle. Uh, <clears throat> recently, Google tested the driverless car uh, over 200,000 miles. Was the car conscious? If not, why do you need to be conscious to drive your car? Uh, sorry, was who conscious? The car. The star? The car. The car. The car. The car. Well, you know, I've never, never been a car, so I don't know what it feels like to be a car. But if I had to bet, I'd bet, no, the car is totally unconscious. Why? Well, it's got, it hasn't got the right kind of machinery for consciousness. But, but the car was tested uh, driverless over 200,000 miles. Well, yeah, uh, uh, so what follows? <laughs> that is, look, okay, I, the, there are two separate questions. One is... Can you simulate intelligent behavior in a system that's totally unconscious? And the answer to that we know is yes. I mean, uh, any adding machine uh, or any uh, uh, computer uh, simulates intelligent behavior in a system that's totally conscious. Could you program a car to go 200, I don't know, 200,000 miles uh, uh, with nobody, uh, no uh, conscious being driving it, and the, and the whole damn thing's unconscious? Why not? It's an engineering problem, and not a, not even a much well, maybe it's of some intellectual interest, but it doesn't sound like it. sounds like it's a hardware problem. Um, something along the same line. I want to clarify what your thought is because at first, on the surface, it seems that you're sort of contradicting yourself or you're not very consistent. When asked about epiphenomenality, um, you, uh, to give an example of what it's for, you gave it from a human point of view. Uh, that you couldn't do most things. Uh, but we were shown a, a, a fruit fly that turns to on one side to avoid um, the heat that was coming up. Okay? And by your answer, if you, you'd say that the, the mouse fly needs to be conscious to do that. So I'm, I'd like to repeat the question, what is it that conscious is required that lower animals that you might think have no consciousness could not yeah. do. Okay, because the way you escaped the question was sort of an easy one, but it made superficially sound that you need to ascertain that the mouse fly has consciousness to do what it does. So I'm repeating the, the, uh, yeah, okay. well, the let question. Me, what is it that... Okay, is let me go through the answer. 
Uh, the question I was asked was, can you name a function of consciousness? Uh, and I thought that meant, is there something I can do when conscious I can't do when unconscious? And the answer to that is there are a prodigious number of things. Now, if somebody, I mean, I, I won't go through the list again, but, but I can't ski, drive a car, write books, read books, uh, I go to the movies, travel. Let's, uh, let's, let's get I can't do animals. all those without being conscious. Okay, but now then let's take, could I build a machine? that could do those things and was unconscious, why not? I mean, I, we're not talking about um, artificial machines, we're talking about me. Okay, now let's talk about animals. Uh, is the fruit fly conscious? Well, the short answer is we don't know. I mean, we'd want to know a whole lot more about how it works. How would you settle it? We, we don't know enough about how the human brain creates consciousness or animal brains to know how far down the phylogenetic scale it works. I have a friend who works on termites. Now, your average termite's only got 100,000 neurons. Well, I lose that many on a big weekend. I know 100,000 <laughs> is not a big deal. Uh, I, but uh, the, I, 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 is the termite conscious? It's not a useful question now because we don't know enough about it. How would we settle it? Suppose we discovered that consciousness was created by a certain neurobiological process, call it XYZ, and that process existed in termites but not in fleas. Then that would be at least evidence that the termites were conscious and the fleas were not. That's how you settle questions like this. We don't yet know enough for it to be an interesting question. So how far down the phylogenetic scale does consciousness go? We don't know. We, we, I can tell you uh, how we might find out eventually, but we're not there yet. What's your guess for the lowest? Oh, well, I actually, my guess is that it goes further down the phylogenetic scale uh, than we uh, uh, would, would otherwise have thought. It's pretty clear that amoeba and paramecia aren't conscious because they haven't got the machinery. Uh, but uh, my guess is uh, that uh, I, the, the damn uh, fruit fly is going to be uh, better able to cope if it can actually see something. If it doesn't just respond visually, if it can actually see, that would be my guess. But that's just a guess. I mean, that is strictly an untutored uh, a piece of speculative neurobiology, the only one I'm going to allow myself today. All right, quick question for Dr. Shaw. Yeah. Um, at the very end of uh, your talk, you, uh, you were talking about cortical columns, and you were showing uh, neurons in layer uh, 2 through 5A and 6 change their activity between conscious and, and less conscious states. But I, I, I didn't catch whether they had increased or decreased their activity. Could you speak to that quickly? Well, I guess I need to get back to my second slide. I do not study consciousness. Right, right, so I'm right, studying okay. mechanism. It's called mode network. Right. So uh, the slide about uh, clusters of layers in a column that uh, show functional connectivity. So there are resting state networks at the level, at the spatial level of cortical columns. Uh, with emphasis on one cluster in layer 3, 4, a little bit of 5A, and another cluster in layer 6 was actually in anesthetized animals, and it's just mechanistic. It's a phenomenon that there are, although we have six layers, we, we usually classify them as six layers. During the resting state, they cluster into two clusters that seem to be independent of each other. Now the interesting question is what happens when we perceive a stimulus, a sensory stimulus, and whether these two independent clusters during spontaneous activity change uh, their activity and all of a sudden become synchronized, or what is the process that happens to these two independent clusters when uh, we get a sensory, when we get to perceive a sensory stimulus. Um, so did I answer your question or? I think so, yes, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, yes, hi, uh, my name is Priya Vera and I'm just uh, representing the general public. Uh, my question is for Dr. Raz. Uh, I didn't have an opportunity to attend your, uh, your lecture because it wasn't uh, open to the public, um, but I have a question about um, 
Uh, now, I've read and I've heard that uh, there is some correlation between people who have extreme religious experiences and those who absolutely have a an, an wonderful feeling when they purchase the latest iPhone. And both of these seem to light up a certain part of the brain. And I would like to know, um, with your ex research in hypnosis, if, there, if we can understand that those phenomena uh, in the terms that we understand hypnosis, as you mentioned, uh, it comes down to uh, extreme attention in a certain amount of time that's given. So the, I guess um, in layman terms, uh, people who are having extreme religious experiences or people who are ex very much taken by a certain brand, are they mildly hypnotized? Okay, so the, the first, the the first comment... Short because we, we're going to yeah. have to take just a Okay, so the first comment is that I think my lecture was open to the public, actually, so you could, you could have attended if you wanted to. But um, hypnosis is all around us. You don't need to be induced in order to experience hypnosis. People get into hypnotic states by shopping, having sex, eating, praying, and so on and so forth. Uh, some people get into hypnosis by getting a formal induction, and other people are getting into hypnosis by exercising on the recumbent bike. So there's no, there's no formal need to have like a hypnotist in order to experience hypnosis. That's the first thing. People who are good, at, like really good hypnotic virtuosos, are difficult to correlate with other things. So for many, many years, for many years, people thought that a good hypnotic uh, uh, subject needs to be female because in the days of Charcot and Freud and like all these giants, all they did was they did hysterical women, you know, back then. And, and you know, people thought that, you know, you got to be a woman in order to, uh, in order to, and that's not clearly not the case. People thought that feeble-minded individuals are hypnotizable, only people who are really weak and so on, and, 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 you know, if you're hypnotized. As a matter of fact, even in the days of Freud, there was another guy uh, from Nancy, a different uh, location in France, who basically said, hey, I showed that everybody can be hypnotized. I mean, you don't need to have a particular, you know, uh, 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 impairment or a particular um, uh, quality. It's something that just happens to, to, to people, some people more than others, and so on. And that's the way we need to think about it. Hypnosis is just a fancy word. Just think about it this way. It's a fancy word to, to describe a situation where you can be in extremely engrossed with a particular object or subject or topic that keeps your attention focused for a sustained amount of time. And when that happens, and if you get really into the thick of it, weird things begin to happen. And these weird things can sometimes be good for you. That's the weirder thing about it. Because th th there's something about going into that zone, the twilight zone, that sometimes you can you know, create thoughts or reflect or, or think about things and see things from a completely different perspective, which you couldn't do otherwise. That's the short answer. Okay, the next Summer Institute can be on hypnosis. The, we can only take, we're going to be thrown out of this hall, I can only take 30-second questions. If you have longer than 30-second questions, don't ask it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, you, I'll be very short. My name is And Pierre. answers should be not much longer. Yes. Uh, my questions are for uh, Dr. Plourd and Dr. Raz. My name is Pierre-Éric Chamberlain from the University of Quebec in Trois-Rivières. It is on hypnotic, hypnotic states and anesthesia. I have read and or heard that uh, if not, hypnotism was used for anesthesia, at least in dentistry. I would like to know if uh, the, the patients are unconscious or they're just not paying attention to the pain. What is your output on in that? In hypnosis, you're always conscious, okay. by definition. If you're hypnotized, you're conscious. But don't confuse hypno hypnosis and hypnotic with hypnotic drugs and with hypnagogic drugs, which my colleague here is going to tell you more I was about. referring to uh, no drugs at all. No drugs at all, you're conscious. Okay. And uh, with drugs, well, you can have uh, sedation while remaining conscious, but usually the dentistry, they aim for sedation and they use uh, agents that uh, are more um, uh, give amnesia. Okay, so you do not believe in uh, hypnosis or self-subjection suge suggestion uh, for anesthesia in dentistry? Like, do you don't, uh, don't really believe well, it's I, I have possible? no expertise with that, but uh, certainly hypnosis might be something that 
could help uh, with, with suitable patients, and that's something that needs to be explored, but I have no knowledge of that. Thank okay, you. Next question. Hypnosis for dentistry is common. Okay. Thank you. Next section, question, 30 seconds. I'm Stephen Roy from McGill. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Searle. You mentioned that uh, you believe that consciousness is uh, pre-existing and modified per by perception, and it, it uh, supposes that there's an order where, con con uh, where consciousness exists first and is then modified. Um, and uh, I'm not convinced of this. Uh, you were unable to convince me. I, I could be convinced that uh, consciousness um, does not exist before perception, but I wonder how you would um, respond to the possibility, a third possibility, that's, that they coexist and that uh, um, when children develop, um, I don't think that there's, I'm not sure, I don't study development, but uh, my impression is that children do not necessarily experience a unified consciousness which is modified per, by perception, and more likely that they, experience, they begin to experience perception and consciousness uh, in a less unified um, and probably simultaneous fashion. Okay, and that's it, Steve. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, 30-second answer. Uh, the answer is that you can have a fully, you can be fully conscious while you're not perceiving anything. Next. A question for Dr. Shmuel. Um, you talked about just briefly that there's the oscillations in fMRI signal in the range of 0.01 to 0.1 hertz, um, but then you didn't really go into uh, where that could arise from and where there's, whether there's any correlation with um, neuronal firing or LFPs, and um, has that mystery been, been figured out? Well, that was the, f the second item on my talk. After showing, after defining resting state networks, uh, if you remember, I showed results of recording neurophysiology simultaneous with fMRI from the visual cortex of monkeys and showing correlation with no task uh, by computing cross-correlation between fMRI signals and neurophysiology in the gamma domain, the high frequency, and with multi-unit activity. Uh, there's a lot to do, uh, still to do, in this field, and my lab pursues it, uh, continues to pursue, the, to pursue it, uh, but, yeah, I mean, the basic principle has been shown already. No, what I meant is, so is it, uh, it's separate from the breathing artifact then? Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It's neurological. <laughs> right. There are contributions of artifacts, but uh, what I showed in the second item is that there is a significant contribution of fluctuations in neurophysiology. So for any of you who is going to, who is interested in pursuing these paradigms using functional MRI, then because of the artifacts, I recommend to plan the study very well in order to record signals such as, uh, as we talked about, the respiration belt or pulse oximeter uh, to measure signals that can allow you in post-processing to regress out the artifacts and to leave in the signal as much as possible contributions from neurophysiological signals. All right, uh, Etienne Zminil, University of Montreal. My question is for Professor Searle. I mean, perhaps uh, Professor Harnard will want to comment. Um, I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering, considering um, the Chinese room argument and more precisely the symbol grounding problem, um, do you think that uh, in order to ground the symbols, you have to ground them in ontological subjectivity or if analog simple analogical representations can contribute anything? Well, I'm not sure exactly what Stephen meant by ground, um, but the uh, conception that I have is that if you know what a word means, you're able to attach a meaning to the word. And that's how you do that depends on the word. Uh, with words like, logical words like if and 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 therefore and but and however, it's different from red and blue and green and square. But you have to be able to uh, 
attach a meaning to the word in such a way that you can understand sentences containing the word. That's so, all. So it could be simply matters. a link between. And the problem with a, with a digital computer, a Quake computer, that with a Turing machine, is it hasn't got the resources for that. All it's got is, is zeros and ones. That's not a weakness. That's the power of the thing, is that it doesn't have to think about what it's doing. It just shuffles the symbols. And then later on, I argue, well, even those aren't symbols except relative to an interpretation. So the two, uh, the, the Chinese room rests on two four-word sentences. Syntax is not semantics, and simulation is not duplication. I, and then another uh, a, a phrase I would add to that is physics is not syntax. You've got to have an interpretation to get the symbols in the first place. What is, okay, okay. Next. Last question. Hi, uh, Madeline Ransom, UBC. Uh, just a quick question for Dr. Raz. Um, I wanted to know concerning the top 10%, bottom 10%, if you'd looked uh, to see if there are other personality traits that are correlated with um, those, those two. So people since uh, the mid-1960s have looked into these kind of things and, you know, they tried to correlate type A behavior and Apollonian and, and people who are control freaks and da 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 da, -da. And we found absolutely nothing that, that sort of uh, holds up. One thing is really, really clear, and that is that um, people who are, uh, the, 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 there was a question over there, people who are spiritual, like particularly spiritual, are not necessarily the best hypnotizable people. And I can tell you from my own experience that some of the, my best subjects that are people who come and say, you're just wasting your time. I'm doing this for course credit. You know, I'm just here to, you know, I'm just here to do this so I can get the check and get the credit. And at the end, they they become my best subjects ever. And when I show them the video later, their jaw just hits the floor. What so, about uh, people who, uh, you know, are avid fiction readers or video gamers? So we, people have looked into all these things. I mean, as I mentioned, sort of half jokingly before, uh, you know, we, we thought that you know, if you're fantasy prone, if you watch Star Trek, if you cry at movies, if you like do all these things, you're going to be the perfect hypnotizability, uh, you know, person. And the answer is no. It's very difficult to predict. And the only one really solid way for us to do this is to look at the Harvard and the Stanford and to get just get people who are peaking on both. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Now. Thank yous. First, I want to thank all the speakers for coming here and for participating. You, you may applaud. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I myself have, been, have received a lot of undeserved thank yous. I would now like to show you who really deserves the thank yous. All I did was send out invitations. You know, that's not a big deal. The people who did this are up on the wall. And what I would like to ask, I know I'm embarrassing you, is for all of you to stand up and each of you to not only identify yourselves, but also don't just say your name, but also say your affiliation and why it is that you did the heroic work that you did for this summer school, because without you, we wouldn't have had it. Please stand up. Uh, rise. I think we have. <laughs> Sasha. Thank you. Where is Pascal? Okay, up you go. Is, is that him there on the screen? 
who was That's terrific. We owe you a lot because the people that are going to be able to see, see the conference that couldn't come over here, it's thanks to you and Matthew. And <laughs> Who else is there? And, and of course, there's also Guillaume Chiquan, who's not here, who had to go because of family health reasons, who was, uh, I, I think, perhaps he did the most work of all. He's been doing work, working on this for two years. Uh, he's the, um, uh, I think, the research officer of the Institute for uh, uh, Cognitive Science. So a, a special thank you to uh, Guillaume Chiquan. Thank you all for coming and staying till the bitter end. For the students who are here, stay just a few more seconds just in case you have any questions for me, but everybody else is excused. Thank you very much, and uh, the proceeding should become, or part of the proceeding at least, should become a book within, I hope, less than a year. Thank you. Students with questions should come up here now because you're going to have trouble finding the other way.